Our first presenter, Becky Helby, became a master gardener in 2015 after retiring from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. She volunteered with the Plot Against Hunger gardening program and gave weekly garden talks at the Arlington Central Library. During the pandemic, Baggy coordinated a garden produce bagging program and delivered more than 15,000 pounds of packaged produce to local food pantries. She also participated in cleaning programs that delivered 40,000 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables to food pantries in 2021. Other than being an extension master gardener, she is also a master naturalist and a distinguished Toastmaster with Toastmasters International. She enjoys many other hobbies, and one of them is romping with her poodle pup named Dolly Do Right. Uh, another one of her new hobby is uh, learning a new language on Duolingo. Uh, with that, I turn the presentation to over to Becky Helby. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and welcome everybody. I will just say that Puen Lee, she was the one that coordinated that big gleaning operation where we collected almost 20 tons of food. So welcome to Foraging in Your Backyard. We are going to cover a lot of things. We're gonna do things a little bit differently because our two other foraging talks that have been recorded dealt with mostly edibles, what you could eat or what you could drink that came from foraging. Well, this time we're going to add in some things that you can make if, as you forage. So some of the useful resources that we get from the natural world. We are not gonna cover mushrooms. Neither one of us are mycologists and mushrooms are really dangerous if you don't know exactly what you're doing. We're not gonna cover animals. This is a vegetarian based program. We're only gonna cover plants, wild plants and some cultivated or domestic plants as well. We're gonna describe what foraging is, why forage, rules of foraging, some do's and don'ts, some additional notes and disclaimer. We're gonna talk about what is available and we're talking about Virginia or this area, Virginia and West Virginia. The uses for some of those foraged items and then the, the resources. In this presentation, we're going to describe foraging as hunting and gathering edible and useful wild or cultivated plants. And as the title suggests, the best foraging may be in your own yard because you know how you care for that yard. Or if you live in an apartment, you can find out how they treat that area and find out if there's been pesticides used, if it's a heavy dog use area. I mean, dog use area, you can still wash things off carefully, but pesticides, that, that would be a bigger concern for me. So then that begs the question, what is edible? Because if you get down to it, almost everything is edible once. We want to talk about things that are edible as in fit to be eaten, things that are not only tasty, but also good for you. When we talk about foraging, foraging can add a lot of nutrition to your diet. And we'll talk about that as we go along. So why forage? It gives you an enhanced connection to nature. It's a great thing to do with, with a family. If you've got young kids or grandkids or neighbor kids, introduce them to, to foraging and get that connection to nature going early on. In some cases, it's, it's necessary. If you're on a long hike and you run out of your snacks, if you see a, a pine tree, you can snip off a few or pull off a few needles and chew on those. Just make sure that you know which trees are edible. Most are, but the, like the U, Y-E-U, that is toxic. Do not eat U. If, you're, if you don't 
know, or if you're really questioning it, go for things that have longer needles. Like the, the white pine has really nice long needles and I have been eating some and they're actually kind of tasty. They have kind of a nice citrusy bite to them. And in some cases, I mean, I hope this never happens to you or any of us, but it might be necessary for survival. So if you know a little bit about foraging, it might help save your life. As I mentioned, the nutrition and valuable resources, when human beings switched from, or many of them switched from the hunter-gatherer to the agrarian, the farming lifestyle, they lost a lot of their nutritional balance. They, they, their health declined. This is the early farmers, their health declined. For one thing, they were only cultivating certain plants, whereas the hunters and gatherers, they might be getting 75 different fruits, nuts, berries, plants, leaves, all kinds of things in their daily diet. With the farmers, they were it was mostly cereals and grains. That turns to sugar. They had a lot more tooth decay than the hunter and gatherer societies did and do. And they weren't getting the, the nutrition. Foraged plants, wild plants especially, they're still out in nature fighting among other plants to survive. So they have a lot of chemicals and phytonutrients that allow them to, to survive, allow them to fight off these other plants that want to compete with them. When we cultivate plants like growing tomatoes, lettuce, things like that in our garden, we pamper those little babies, don't we? We weed around them, we water them, we feed them. So those natural defenses that the wild plants had, those have been bred out of our cultivated plants for the most part. So the forage plants, if they are ones that are fit to be eaten for humans, they're likely to be much more nutritious than the lettuces and things like that. So think about like chickweed, it's gonna have a lot more nutrition than bib lettuce that you've grown in your garden. I'm, I'm a gardener too, and I do grow lettuce, but just bear that in mind. The availability in Virginia, we have so much diversity of, of plants. So foraging is really great in this area. There's some important rules of foraging. We want to honor the law, put that right at the top, make sure that where you're foraging is legal. Don't go in someone's yard unless you get permission. Don't go into a, a public park unless you know that you're allowed to, to forage. And I'm talking about if you have to dig for things, if you're just picking a few berries or something, I'm not saying do it, but you're likely not to have any problem with it. So make sure you know where you are. National parks, I know there, there are sticklers about this. I used to work for Fish and Wildlife, National Wildlife Refuges. I don't know any that would allow foraging, but if you got permission, then maybe you could do it. So honor the plant. What we mean by that is if you are picking berries somewhere, don't just break the branches or you know break them off so you can get to the berries. Bend them down gently or bring a stepladder or whatever you need to get to them. Don't tear the plant apart trying to get to what you want. And if it's, there's a rule of 30%. If it's a plant where you take things off of it, try not to take more than 30%. If it's a plant, if you see a, a whole spread of plants, try not to take more than 30% of what you see. We're losing a lot of the really popular foraged plants, such as ramps, which is in the onion family. There used to be ramp, well, there still are ramp festivals in different places, but it's hard to find ramps out in nature because so many people know how good they are and they scarf them all up rather than following the rule of 30%. Honor the land. If you do have to dig or if you're out on a foraging expedition, don't litter pick things up. If you dig something, then put the dirt back, pack it in. Try to leave the place better than you found it. And also, as far as honoring land, make sure you know where you're foraging, that you're not near somewhere where there's lead paint, because that can leach into the ground and affect the plants around it. It's best to know 
a little bit of the history of where you're foraging. That's why I like to forage on my own property because I know I don't use any pesticides or chemicals and I know it's safe to eat. And honor yourself. Just try things that you know are edible, but just try a little bit because we all have different allergies. We all will react to food differently and we don't want anybody to get sick or have a bad experience with foraging. Here's some of the do's and don'ts. You can read all of these. I'm just gonna point out a few. Please don't ever ingest anything that you're not 100% certain is safe to eat. That's really important. There's some lookalikes. Puen and I were just talking about two lookalikes that we both have in our yard. And thankfully, both of them, this is henbit and purple dead nettle, they look alike. And the good news is, is that they're both edible. So even if you don't know this is henbit or this is purple dead nettle, as long as you know it's one of the two, it's good to eat. And like I say, be careful that you know where you're foraging. You don't want a bunch of car oil or gas or other chemicals on what you're gonna eat. And then of course, when in doubt, leave it out. If you're not 100% sure, don't try it. We'd love for you to enjoy this presentation with a grain of salt. Neither Puen or I are doctors or health experts and we don't pretend to be. Please use your common sense, try small amounts first. And remember that natural doesn't mean edible. People think, oh, native plants, they're wonderful, but they're not all edible. Just because they're native and local doesn't mean they're good for us to eat. And another thing that I get questions on, someone will say, well, I saw a squirrel eating those, or I saw a bird eating those pokeweed berries. Well, the pokeweed berries are fine for birds, but they're not good for us. So just make sure that you're not eating something just because you saw another animal eating it. So now we're gonna talk about what's available now or soon. And this is just a little highlight, a little preview of what we're gonna be talking about. The first one is the Jerusalem artichoke or Helianthus tuberosus. It is in the sunflower genus. It's in the daisy family. This is a North American native plant with yellow flowers. It has come to the East Coast, but it originated in more the central part of the United States. It has other names like sunchoke and sunroot and tapenambor, which is more a popular name in Europe for this plant. The Europeans found this here in the United States and they took it back over. It's very popular in some parts of Europe. It's not so well known here. A few years ago, some restaurants started advertising sunchoke salads and sauteed sunchokes, but I certainly, i have not that I've been going to restaurants lately, but I haven't seen it that much. The common name is misleading. It has nothing to do with Jerusalem. It probably came from the fact that in Italy, the name for sunflower is girasol. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but girasol, Jerusalem, okay. And some people think that the tuber tastes a little bit like artichoke. It, to me, it's, it's a little, not really spicy. It's just got an interesting earthy flavor and it's, it's like a water chestnut in consistency. It's got a little crispness to it and you can eat it raw as well as pickled, sauteed, steamed or roasted. And here at the bottom, you can see that in Europe, they make a wine, a beer and a brandy all with this, the sun choke. It's even used, it can be used to make ethanol for our cars. So there you go. If the gas keeps going up in price, maybe people are gonna start looking at, at uh, Jerusalem artichoke again for our, our cars to run on. It is a perennial plant and it can be an aggressive spreader. The Native Americans cultivated this and that's how it spread to the East and the West. And it contains inulin, not insulin, it's inulin. So for, again, I'm not a health expert, but it is supposed that for some people with diabetes, this might be a better alternative than potatoes because they, you won't have the same glycemic spike in your blood sugar levels 
when you eat these tubers as you do when you eat potatoes. But I will warn you, this is where, you, where I say, just try a little bit first. It's also known as the fartichoke. You want to dig up the tubers after the frost and even refrigerate them to keep them cold. I made the mistake of harvesting some, I must have been in the fall and before it got cold and before the frost and oh my gosh, I had the worst case of gas ever. It was really not good. So just again, bear that in mind, try a little bit first. They are delicious. They're a good source of, pro of potassium, iron and other minerals. The next is the river birch, and this is going to get into our, our crafting section. River birch is also known as black birch, water birch. It's a Virginia native tree, grows 40 to 80 feet tall, and the sap can be used to make birch beer, vinegar, or it can be boiled for a sweet syrup. The wood is also useful for smaller things, prosthetic limbs. It's going to have a lot of knots in it, so it's not good for as, as timber for building houses or big furniture or something. The paper bark oils, oh my goodness, if you're ever out camping and you can find some birch paper, that will get your fire started lickety split. It's really good. It's also, it's got some oil, so it's kind of a waterproof paper. Thomas Jefferson said that you should always carry some birch paper with you when you're out in the field, if it's if it's rainy or, or humid, because you could write your notes on this and they it wouldn't it would be able to be written on. It doesn't it doesn't get wet like other paper would. The paper bark is also used in basket making. They take pretty thick sheets of it to make basket weaving. We're just talking about protecting the tree, being nice to the tree, taking just those little these little thin papery parts to make river birch beads. Now at my church, we make beads. These are made from regular paper. We take our church bulletins and we cut them the same as here. We cut them into these long triangular strips and then roll them on a wire coat hanger. And you start at the wide end and start just roll, 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 roll. And then you get the little tiny tip at the end and that's where you put your drop of glue. So these, these are ones made with, with regular paper. And these are ones that I made with the birch bark paper. And you can see it's cut, they're kind of pretty. They've got different variations of the brown. You can even get some gray in there. And if you wanted to, you could spray them with a shellac or with a lacquer to better protect them and make them last longer and give them a more of a finished shine. So here's the instructions right down here. You just cut them into long triangles, roll them on the wire, wide end to narrow, and then glue the end. Couldn't be simpler. Another good project if you've got younger people. Evergreen cones and tree seed pods have a lot of uses as well. These are just some that I picked up on hikes and such. So you can make really stunning pine cone reeds. There's a lot of DIYs available online. And this is something that I did. I've got a sweet gum tree just up the street from me and I spray painted this gold. A friend of mine said that when he was growing up, their family did this every Christmas and then hung them on the Christmas tree. You could. I mean, I was thinking, gosh, they're so lightweight. You could almost use them, use them for earrings, but they're so prickly, it would really be annoying after a while. Or you could just put them into a nice little arrangement in a glass or in a vase. And here's something I did just, we are, are still in this pandemic and there is a way to reimagine COVID through nature. This is just a sweet gum ball, this one right here. And I just spray painted it. So this is what they look like when they're not painted. And you can just use spray, spray paint and fingernail polish and you've got your little COVID virus. 
right? That's that's me. Any questions? What is the best method for controlling the spread of Jerusalem artichoke in your yard? Dig it up. That's I did that. I it's in the wrong spot in my yard, which is common in my yard. <laughs> Everything's in the wrong spot, and I don't know that until until it takes over. But anyway, so I dug it. I dug up a bunch last fall. And I knew that I didn't get it all. And now I'm glad because those tubers were really tasty and they were the ones I dug up were pretty big. So just digging it up is, is the best way. So we'll go on to our next presentation uh, by Puen Lee. Puen Lee is a longtime resident of Arlington and was a master gardener from the class of 1999. She started the Plot Against Hunger program in 2007 and managed both the fresh produce and Plot Against Hunger programs at the Arlington Food Assistance Center for 13 years. She retired in late 2019, right before the pandemic. She is also a founding member of the Arlington County Urban Agriculture Task Force. Uh, these past two years have been given her extra free time to focus on her gardening, gleaning, foraging edibles, and trying out new recipes. Now, I present Pu Wen Li. So thanks for joining us today. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a few things that I foraged this past fall and winter. And I'm also going to mention some plants that you can look out for in the next couple months at, in your yards um, as the weather gets warm. So the first is not foraging, um, strictly foraging as we know it, um, that is using plants as sources of food, but it's probably similar to what our hunter-gatherer ancestors gathered and found useful, um, that is using dried leaves. Uh, what we enjoy in the summer months for their beauty, like irises, can also be used in other ways. So as we trim away the dead foliage from perennials this spring, um, instead of throwing the leaves into your compost pile, you might consider using them for cordage and braiding, which is what I'm going to talk about now. Um, this past winter, I found out that dried iris leaves, that is uh, both the bearded variety and Siberian and Japanese varieties, um, are great materials to create twining and roping. Um, the method is very simple, and I'm just going to go through the slides, and then I'm going to actually try to show it to you on, um, on camera. Um, so you wait until the leaves are dried on the plant. You can tug a little bit in the uh, base of the, uh, where it's connected to the, the root or rhizome. And um, if it comes off freely, you can, that's a perfect um, leaf to harvest. Um, take them inside, let them dry in a single layer. And then after about a week or two, depending on how uh, humid or dry your house is, um, and you're ready to start your project, you can wrap them in uh, a damp uh, towel overnight just to moisten them and make them more pliable. Um, take them out and you can start to uh, braid them or weave them. Um, I, I'm going to show you, I think I'll just start now. Actually, this is a, a Asiatic lily um, from the yard. And what I do, and I'll show you the other. This is um, Siberian iris. You can see the difference in terms of the width of each. Um, so what I do is I take, I'll do it with this. You can take four pieces and this is not exact. Um, and I would do uh, two tips and two butts alternating them so that the, um, the braid is similar in width all the way along and even. So here I actually have a dried piece. Okay, so here you have your your leaves together, you simply start twisting it. And you'll notice as you're twisting 
that it's starting to curve. You see that just by the, the tension that's created with the leaves. And then here you've got this little neat little curve that starts. Well, that's a nice little handle for you to hold. And then you twist your, use your dominant hand, twist the top, tuck it under, pick the next one up, tuck it under, and you're gonna continue doing this. I'll do it pretty quickly. Keep holding it with your other hand. It's actually pretty relaxing. <laughs> so, and then you, it's like knitting, I think, if, if one could knit. So here you have, do you see that? And so this is um, what I created. I created long lengths of, I mean, it can go on forever. Can you see this? Long lengths of cord. Um, the, the longer the um, Japanese iris and Siberian iris, I mean, you can just go on forever. I still haven't decided what to do with them. Um, I did make some friendship bracelets. Um, I gave one to my husband. Um, and the wonderful thing is, you know, you can throw it away, you can wear it and it will dry, um, you know, wear it in the shower, it can get wet. Um, and I was thinking, well, you know, you could actually, one thing I did um, around Christmas is I had some chilies that I was drying from the um, garden and I used, I tied them and then gave them away as presents. Um, this fall, I got a ton of black walnuts. These are not pretzels, they're actually black, black, black walnuts that I collected and I still haven't had time to uh, dig the meat out of the, of the nuts. Um, black walnuts uh, have, uh, is a, are a deciduous tree, most of us know about them. Um, they have a very pungent odor um, in the bark, the leaves, the, the nuts. Um, they're native to the United States, um, growing 100 to 130 feet in height. Um, and I think the best way really is uh, to identify them is to just rub some of the leaves together in your hand and you'll, you will smell this very distinctive odor um, from them. Next, please. Um, black walnut trees are native to the United States and they grow along uh, the East Coast as far north as Maine and to parts of the Florida Panhandle and as far west as parts of uh, Texas, Kansas, um, Missouri. Um, they're a much maligned tree, um, unless you live in a huge piece of property because uh, of their allopathic qualities. Um, the roots and leaves contain a substance called juglone that inhibits the growth of certain other plants um, if they're grown near them. And this is a natural defense mechanism of the tree. Um, other trees like hickories also have this, but not to such an extent as the uh, black walnut. Um, vegetable gardeners often resort to, who have black walnuts often resort to building raised beds uh, to avoid the roots of the, the tree. Um, we did that at the Ball Cellars house, the, the oldest uh, standing residence of it here in Arlington. Um, because there was a kitchen garden that was probably 20 feet away from a, a walnut tree. Um, and landscape gardeners um, can actually choose varieties that will tolerate, plant varieties that will tolerate the juglon and the roots. Um, and this is a, you know, very wise practice that makes more sense to me than, than chopping down a tree. Um, I have in the references a uh, Penn State uh, publication um, listed that shows all the different plants, um, shrub, plants, shrubs, and trees that are tolerant to uh, walnut, tolerate uh, black walnuts. Um, black walnuts are prized for their timber, their leaves and husks uh, have been used for natural dyes. The trees themselves, um, like the paper birch can be tapped for syrup, um, sap for syrup. And the shells um, I found in doing my research for this up top are used as abrasives for fine finishing of um, automobiles and wood furniture, and also in cosmetics as exfoliants. And who knew it, but um, as fillers in dynamite and also filtering um, um, products, uh, 
for uh, filtering crude oil. In terms of food, um, most walnuts that we know um, and buy at the store are the so-called English Persian walnut and 98% of the, of the walnuts that are grown in the United States are that variety. Um, they're mostly grown in the Central Valley of California. The remaining 2% are the black walnuts that I'm gonna be talking about today, which you can find growing in the wild. Um, black walnuts are actually one of three wild foods that are sold commercially in the United States, the others being wild rice and wild mushrooms. Um, apparently in the 1940s, there were several small processors in the United States uh, that cropped up uh, that who had discovered ways to remove the husk of the walnuts um, and also to crack them and extract the meat. The, those have all slowly uh, closed down except for one. Um, the last commercial collector of black walnuts is Hammonds um, based in Southwestern Missouri. Um, they run in a very interesting a very interesting method of collecting. They will pay 15 cents per pound for unhusked walnuts in all state uh, stages. And, you know, from green, the very green to the, the black when it becomes black and, and soft. Um, and pickers go out with their buckets and rakes and um, bags and will bring them to collection sites um, around the United States. So the next slide, you can see there's a truckload. Uh, someone's gone out to, to gather black walnuts and they will bring them to one of the collection sites that are on the map here on the right. Uh, the nearest one to us, I checked, um, is in Ohio. So that's quite a distance to drive. So I'm suggesting that you just harvest your own and eat it uh, in your yard. Um, not only are black walnuts black gold lying on the ground, but they're also good for you. And so if you go to the Hammond's website, here they have a total health nut um, page. Um, and you can see it's good for your heart health, good for your bones. Um, it has the most protein, black walnuts have the most protein of any edible tree nut. So, uh, next, please. So in my very small Arlington yard, and this is not my Arlington yard that I'm showing you, um, a neighbor has a tree that drops nuts all over be between four yards. And I sometimes am able to collect some of the green ones, but I often don't get enough um, before the squirrels get them first. So where I find most walnuts each, each fall is at a farm that we stay at um, in West Virginia. The land was used for orchards in the past and large areas have been cleared, but near the settlement where families uh, who worked on the orchard lived, the property is dotted with oaks, walnuts, chestnuts, and uh, wild cherry trees. So in the middle distance, um, this is a, a photo actually of a, a neighbor's house across the, the county road that cuts through the property. Um, there, it's right there in, beyond the, um, the, the oak tree. And then there's some walnuts right there. That's where, that's my main collection site um, in the fall months. Um, so next. Um, so there are a couple ways to get first collect and then get the husk off the, the nuts. One is to collect them as you see them, put them in a plastic bag, you know, wear gloves and then bring them home, get a sturdy knife. Here's my hori hori. And I, you know, just, just work the husk off of the, um, the, the outer husk off. Uh, the other way, which is my way of doing it, is to wait until a tractor or some cars pass over the, the fallen nuts in the road. And then just go and um, with my, you know, a sturdy pair of shoes that I don't care much about, remove the husk with my feet and then put it into a plastic bag. So uh, next. 
So what you do is that you uh, gather your nuts, take them home, and um, let them dry for a couple weeks until you can handle them without your hands getting stained. And then um, go at it with, um, with a hammer or a, uh, I found bricks actually work really well. And my basement floor is a perfect uh, concrete surface to work on. Um, but then you have to give it a pretty solid whack. Um, and then once you have them open, um, I found uh, that it's easier to uh, extract the nut meat if you've let them sit open uh, for a couple weeks. Um, and I tried everything this last year to get them out using skewers and other things like that. But uh, finally, a friend of mine um, gave me her mother's, or uh, lent me her mother's um, nut picker a silver nut picker. And it's got a little curved end on it. I think you've probably all seen this. Maybe you're, um, and Jane Lungen, who is, uh, you know, usually our, the third person um, in our foraging talk, she has, uh, she showed me a, a set of maybe 12 uh, nut pickers from her, uh, her mother-in-law, silver, that were in a velvet lined case. And, um, uh, you know, I can just imagine in the old days when there wasn't TV or any other distracting things that people would spend their evenings um, sitting and, uh, and picking um, nut, nut meat out of nuts. So, and how do you use them? Next, please. Um, we were recently in Florida and in the local Piggly Wiggly uh, grocery store, I found two um, ice cream uh, varieties, uh, excuse me, ice cream makers that um, had black walnuts, uh, not flavored black walnuts, but actually black walnuts in the ice cream. Um, at home, I usually use them in baked goods. You don't need a lot. You can usually, if they ask for English walnuts, you can probably get by with just using a quarter of the amount because the flavor is so distinctive. Now's the time to be outside weeding, uh, cleaning up and looking for spring greens. Um, the remaining plants that I wanna talk about are plants that are usually harbingers of the spring. That is what we would normally have suggested you look out for um, emerging. Uh, this winter, however, because of the weather, um, two of these plants, chickweed, which is on the upper left, and uh, what I call field crest, or Becky calls uh, hairy bitter crest shotweed, um, they persisted in my yard through the winter months so that we continued to have them in our salads um, through in, into December. Um, I want to repeat. Uh, Becky's words of caution that you should know where you're harvesting and that herbicides and pesticides have not been used. You're not harvesting in a brown field or um, uh, any not near roadways or parking lots where plants may be affected by runoff um, from chemicals. So um, chickweed, what are the other two that I have here? Um, garlic mustard can be used for pesto, the one that is um, the, th that one, yes, thank you. And then also dandelion greens. Um, dandelions are edible, all parts are edible, the flower, the roots, and the leaves. Um, the last one I wanna talk about is something that is incredibly surprising to me. At the beginning of COVID, um, I had just retired and my plan was that I would spend the early spring digging out all the hosta that was in my yard that I planted maybe 25 years ago. Um, divide up the root balls, put most of them on the curb for neighbors to pick up for free. Um, and at the very same time we were preparing for a foraging talk. And um, what, I, and I thought, well, since I'm doing this, I might as well look and see whether hostas are edible. Um, and by golly, they are. Um, 
hostas, which are also known as plantain lily, um, originated in East Asia, in China, Japan, and they are actually foraged there in the mountains. Um, they were brought to Europe and to the United States as uh, landscape plants um, and kind of losing the, their antecedents in that way. Um, and so they're in the family Asparagacea. Um, so you can guess, they taste just like asparagus. Um, so what I do is this would probably be early April when the first shoots are coming out in my garden. Um, you harvest the shoots um, just at ground level. And um, when they the leaves have not opened up and then give them a quick wash, dry them and saute them two minutes on a side in a little oil with a sprinkle of salt. And it's an excellent, excellent dish. So uh, last slide, um, this is a salad that I made last um, spring. Um, I think it's dandelion greens and chickweed, um, red bud and violets. Um, so happy foraging. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the chat. Yes. We do have a few questions. The first question is, what do you do with ginkgo berries? Well, ginkgo is a fall nut to forage. Um, we actually did a talk, I did a talk two years on that, ago on that. Um, they are, you can roast them. Um, I put them in soups and stir fries. Um, it's important to, when you have removed the outside, the soft outside portion and gotten into the nut, that you boil them uh, maybe a couple times um, for maybe three or four minutes at a time to extract some of, there's some um, poison toxin in the, the ginkgos. And they say sometimes to uh, not eat more than seven or eight at a time. So again, back to what Becky said, um, you know, taste a little bit and see whether it agrees with you or not. Um, so. The next question is someone has uh, either wild onions or wild garlic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mulch bear and <laughs> how to so tell I the just, difference. I how just um, got some out of my garden, I, just, just coming up. And I'm like, I'm going to get you before you spread all over. Um, you can eat the tops like onion, uh, for, like chives. And the bottom, when I was a kid, we somehow there was part of our our property that had a whole field of wild onions. And we decided we would make um, something that in China, it's called kyutao. It's a shallot, but it's pickled. Um, and so we had, you know, bottles of this, my brother and I, we probably spent three or four days um, foraging them and then pickling them. But, um, you know, the bottom can be used as an onion too. Great time to weed and a great time to forage as well. They were trying to, if you could give them some uh, suggestions on how to tell the difference between wild onion and wild garlic. I have, I don't know what wild garlic looks like. Becky, do you know? No, one of them I think are hollow leaves and one are flat leaves, but I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not going to yeah. So the yeah. wild, the wild onion, it definitely is like a chive in it. And I see that it's hollow. I would imagine that, a, you know, if you look up ramps, which is a garlic, um, you can find out more information. I wanted to say um, the whole notion of respecting the plant is really important. Uh, ramps, it's, illegal apparently in Ontario, I believe, to, to harvest ramps now to forage them because people have not, they've taken whole plants instead of taking one leaf 
um, from a, a plant. They've taken the whole plant. And so those numbers have dwindled to such an extent that the government took some action. So um, anyways, that's, that's an aside. Next question is, someone is building a new house in the middle of woods in Virginia. Mm. And there is a lot of berry on the property. And they would like to know if you have a recommendation for a mix of uh, native seeds that can provide them with uh, forageable edibles. Mm. I think the, oh, I'm trying to think of the, um, there's a food forest in Maryland. Uh, I'll try to, I'll try to get that information, um, which, you know, from the very bottom to the top, you know, um, having uh, fruits, nuts, berries, uh, in that forest would be a wonderful um, opportunity. You can also do mushrooms, my God. Um, but I'm not, I can't speak to this really. Are there any native uh, plant people on this call who can talk about that? Well, uh, one suggestion that seeds very quickly is violets, violets, mm -hmm. different kinds of violets. So they can, they can draw in and will come up on the sure. bare soil. And you can get them um, on the internet very easily, those seeds. That's my suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, I recommend, uh, I recommend planting some native shrubs as well. High bush blueberries, they are, they're doing great on my property. And you usually need two from two different cultivars or different, you know, different plants to get the best fruit. Although I have one that is pretty much by itself and it produces gangbusters year after year. So high bush blueberries, blackberries, raspberry, think berries as well if, if you've got, if you want some shrubs. Or service berry. There you go. I'll pause. Right. Yep. Okay. The Next question is about your demonstration of uh, weaving the leaves. Yes. How do you add in the next leaf? And then a related question is after you finished, how do you stop from the cordage from unwinding? Oh, okay, so I'll answer the last one. So can you see this? I just, I just tied a knot at the end to make it stop. I simply start twisting it and working it in and then use the same, the other part. And you know, if you, if you choose equal lengths of uh, leaf, um, they'll pretty much end at the same time. So you won't have this, you'd have this. I'm just, sorry, it's not working the way I thought it would. You see how I'm, I've just extended it by adding something in. And this part here, I can just trim off later on. See that? So that's how you keep on adding. I mean, it, it's, uh, it's trial and error, but I think it's, it's, not so, it's not as hard as it looks. It's not actually hard. So yeah, you just keep, keep on adding. Yeah. And then trim, trim your, um, where you add, just like, I guess when you're knitting, you know, you tuck things in, you, you trim them off, so. Okay. Our next question is how many leaves can you take from the hosta before harming the plant? I, it depends on <laughs> if you want to get rid of your hostas. Um, I think you could take safely, if I had a clump with 10 shoots coming out, I could take, I would probably take two or three. Um, what I noticed is that in the early spring, you're cutting the, sh it's coming up as a shoot, but there's still more leaf growth, you know, still growing underneath it. So you're not actually, um, you, you might actually see after you've cut the shoot 
that more will emerge from that same shoot. Um, hmm. I haven't tried to harm my hostas. <laughs> so I really don't know. I don't know how to answer that. But, but I would say, you know, 10%, 20% should not hurt your hostas. Next question well, is, do, do you use red bud leaf in your salad? I haven't, but I don't know if they're edible. Okay. I don't, I don't know either. I thought you said flower. The flowers are definitely edible. The, the flower is what I showed. So are the little bean pods, but you know what? I uh, Let me look that up because I do remember the little bean pods when they're, when they're new and tender, those can also be like sauteed like, like beans. One thing I wanted to say about the black walnut we get a lot of questions because spotted lanternfly is coming into our area and the, the host, the best host plant for spotted lanternfly is the tree of heaven, which is a terrible invasive. It's not a native, it's, it's an aggressive, terrible invasive. And the tree of heaven often looks like, does look like a black walnut, which is a native tree. And I had a friend come and say, how do I get rid of this tree of heaven in my backyard? And I looked at it and the best thing, like Puen was saying, it's got a pungent or odor, especially on the leaves. So the, an easy way to tell a black walnut from a tree of heaven is to crush the leaves and smell them. If it's black walnut, it's gonna have that kind of sour pungent smell. If it's tree of heaven, I've been told it smells like burnt peanut butter. Hmm and very much more of a bitter smell, a smoky smell than the more pungent, soury black walnut. To me, black walnut is so iconic. I mean, I, when I smell it, I say, oh yeah, that, I know what that is. And I was able to save that tree because it mm. was a black walnut. And we looked over and his neighbor has a black walnut in their yard. So obviously that's where this tree came from. It'd be interesting to compare the so black walnut, they're all both compound leaves, but the, the number of leaves, I think walnuts are odd uh, numbered. And I don't know whether, you know, Tree of Heaven might be an even number. Um, huh? yeah. Someone asked, is a toxic version of a plant that it's uh, like a wild onion and wild garlic that's toxic to humans? A look-alike? Yeah, something. I don't know, but I wouldn't, if you're not sure what it is, if, if it's, if you take just the littlest tip off the green tip and taste it, it's going to taste like chive or onion. And, and those, those are, those are fine. There is a book that I really like. I don't like to call myself an idiot. So these idiot guides aren't my favorite, but this one is really good. This one, it, I found it at Central Library here in Arlington. And it's The Idiot's Guide to Foraging by Mark Vorderbruggen. And I like his book because he has the lookalikes. So for all the plants that he's covering, he, he, he says, watch out for this one if there's a, a, a bad actor, you know, if there's a, a bad plant that might hurt you. He says, this is what it looks like. Or he might say, you know, purple dead nettle and henbit look very much alike, but they're both edible. So no, not so much worries with those. And I did just look up red bud leaves and they can be used sparingly when they're young, either sauteed or even put raw into salad. So there you go. But the flowers and the, and the bean pods are also edible. Thank you. Next question is, uh, what is edible on a white pine tree? The needles, the, the, the needles really. And you just take little bits, you know, you don't want to, you just chew on them. It's sort of a nice thing to do when you're hiking. That's what I did when I was walking the dog the other day. I said, I've never tried pine needles. And here I keep hearing about it on foraging sites. And so I, there's a white pine right there and I just picked some needles and I just kind of chewed on them. And yeah, it takes you it takes a while to get to 
chew them up and uh, it's, it's kind of pleasant. It's, kind, it's a little almost minty, but so I don't know. I don't always just know how to describe tastes, but it's, it's unique and it's not bad. So try it. Just not you. Don't the Y-E-U, stay away from you. It's got short needles and red berries. Don't do it. The next question is how to propagate blackberries from cuttings. And uh, is it legal to get cuttings from plants in the pots, natural pots? I know that the Park Service and Fish and Wildlife would frown on people taking pieces off of their plants. If you, I, I would say get them from a friend, if you know someone, or, or if you go to a, a pick your own, just ask them if you can take a cutting. But I don't know that I've grown blackberries from cuttings. I have thornless blackberries in my backyard and the canes just come up everywhere. So I dig them up and they go in the plant sale or I give them to neighbors or whatever. But you know, that's the thing with when you start growing plants, if especially native plants, if they're happy, so many of them are gonna spread and then you can share them. We were just, we just dug up a bunch of golden ragwort and a few other native plants for the spring garden kickoff. I'm gonna put in a little plug because we have a minute. Uh, this is taking place at Central Library tomorrow from 10 to two. The weather's gonna be a lot different. It's gonna be horrible, but we're moving things inside. Anyway, golden ragwort is a really nice ground cover and everybody's looking for ground cover. It spreads, so some people don't like it because it spreads pretty aggressively, but what's wrong with that? Just dig it up, pot it up and give it away to your neighbors. Because we all, it'd be great to have more golden ragwort instead of English ivy and periwinkle and all the non-native ground covers that people use. They're, they're, not, they're not doing any good. I, I think one way you can um, possibly, if you have the blackberries in your yard or in a friend's yard, you can actually uh, bend a cane down and put a, a rock or something on it and let, just let it root itself and then cut that newly rooted section off and use that as a, as a new plant. Um, there probably are, you could, I've never done it myself, but I think you could cut it, put a little bit of root tone and then um, uh, put it in some, some sharp sand or something to, to let it um, start to root as well. Okay, I think we just have two more questions. Can you go back to the slide on uh, black walnut? And the uh, last question is, uh, person asked, is uh, golden redwood edible? No. No, it's just a good native plant, but no, it's not edible. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Uh, one, are fig leaves edible? Not to my knowledge. Figs well, are the okay. figs. They're they're edible. I don't know how they taste because when I've actually wrapped. Oh, it's a really good dish. Uh, you can wrap peaches in them and bake them in in a fig leaf. Um, I think they're edible. I mean that you know you won't. But uh, there's a little bit of sap that comes out of the the stem, the leaf stem, um, and I don't know, so I don't know what that would taste like in your mouth if you ate it raw, but I, I, you know, edible. Oh, I see, yes, I missed one question. Uh, fig Ooh, leaves. Rice and uh, fig leaves, that sounds really good. Yes. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. Are there regular garden variety fig leaves that's edible? Not sure what the, because this person got some tea that's made from fig leaves. So she wants to know what's a regular garden variety. I, I'm not an expert on that and probably different figs, leaves have different tastes. So yeah, absolutely. just like different figs have different tastes. Yeah. And the fig leaves, you know, there's, I've got a fig tree out in my yard and I don't know what it is. It was given to me. <laughs> and he didn't know what it was so but it's it makes great figs but there's other figs that 
can get to be like this big. There's a church near here and oh my goodness, those figs are <laughs> gorgeous. And the leaves are completely different than the leaves on my tree. They're not the, and then you've got the figs that you see indoors at different offices and stuff. They'll have these huge gangly figs and those leaves are completely different than the fig leaves with the edible figs. So you need to know, you need to look it up and know which type of leaf. And just because you use it to wrap something, I mean, think about tamales. They use corn husk to wrap the tamale, but you don't eat that corn husk. I mean, it's not, it's be awfully fibrous, but so there's things that you use in cooking that you don't necessarily ingest. Yeah. Okay, that's just uh, one last question just came in. My, uh, a person has a neighbor that has uh, mosquito control spray uh, off uh, regularly in the summer. Do you uh, count mosquito spray as a uh, pesticide poison? To Absolutely. I know that they tell you that it's harmless and all this other that's made with chrysanthemums and blah, blah, but it kills everything. It kills good insects, bad, boy, boy, boy. I gotta watch myself, but I, if we could just educate those type of neighbors that they're, they're after the wrong part of the insect life. The, you, you don't wanna go after killing the adult mosquitoes. You wanna get the, the larvae that are in water. So if you put a bucket and you put some water in it and you put some grass clippings in it and you let it set and get all stinky mushy, those female mosquitoes will go there in droves and lay their eggs in that stinky messy bucket that you've got outside where you want that, where, where you're trying to trap them. And then you put a mosquito dunk, those little donut things, those little mosquito dunks, that's got the Bacillus thuringiensis, and that's gonna kill the mosquito larvae, and then you won't get the adults in your yard. And you need to do that on a regular basis. The other thing is you can have a fan or two fans, just, a, just not a barn fan, not the big things, but just a little oscillating fan wherever you're entertaining in your backyard and just have that fan blowing gently. Mosquitoes are very poor flyers and you're gonna keep away the vast majority of them. So there's a lot of things to do before you call those mosquito companies. But yes, that I would, I would be leery if, if I had that kind of stuff blowing into my yard. So okay, that uh, concludes the uh, questions. And this last slide is just showing our help desk is open for Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia, nine to noon, Monday through Friday. It's open now uh, by email. And it's, shoot, I don't have the email on here. Oh, that's bad of me. It's, it's M-G-A-R-L-A-L-E-X at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, thank you, Becky and Poon, for today's great presentation, and Julie for hosting and managing the chat box. Uh, everyone should get an email, a follow-up email, on the links that's being recorded for today and the uh, resource list from this uh, presentation. That concludes the uh, presentation for today. <laughs>